Good uh, morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here uh, to address such uh, an august uh, uh, audience. Uh, I uh, feel dwarfed somehow by the expertise of uh, the many colleagues here uh, and the speakers who have shared their uh, thoughts on these very complex issues. Um, my colleagues uh, may have already touched on some of the matters I will be discussing, uh, so I'll try to be brief, uh, bearing in mind that I will be speaking perhaps toward the end of the day on a more operational uh, side of maritime security. The focus of my uh, talk is really on wind farms, and I was asked to look at the applicability of uh, the IMO maritime security instruments. So you've already been versed into some of the aspects of SUA, uh, SOLAS, and ISPS code. Um, let me just uh, I think one. take you through the uh, outline. The, uh, I'll, I'll just first of all introduce the rationale of uh, talking about the maritime security challenges of wind farms, offshore wind farms, because it does raise several eyebrows. Um, then we will uh, move into the core of my presentation, which is um, whether the, uh, the IMO instruments should be uh, considered as covering those offshore wind farms. Then I'll uh, touch upon some elements of comparative law, so that would be uh, perhaps of interest since we, uh, we, we, uh, we have uh, a professor from Japan who will talk to us about that. So I won't talk, touch on Japanese law, but I'll uh, mention some uh, UK legislation on the matter, as well as uh, an inroad into US law. So initially, uh, as I said, why should we uh, discuss the security of uh, offshore wind farms. I've taken these pictures from the uh, uh, Blo Planeten, which is the uh, Copenhagen Aquarium, uh, and you may be able to see the wind farms just uh, offshore uh, in the stretch of the Sound, the, the Öresund between Denmark and uh, Sweden. Uh, this, the, these wind uh, uh, turbines are somehow quite close to various civil amenities on both sides of, the, uh, uh, of these neighboring countries. So uh, the security at sea does cover basically everything that is uh, closely related to the interests of, of the states involved. And there's no reason why we should not uh, talk about the security of uh, offshore installations, including wind farms. Uh, to an extent, I would say also that uh, we've heard of the environmental considerations. Uh, wind turbines are unsightly, and there's even a debate whether they're uh, actually good for the environment. So you may find uh, more uh, environmental campaigners targeting these, uh, th these, these structures, which could be also, as, as uh, some various speakers have said, a, a security threat in itself. Uh, we also tend to, I think, as part of the considerations of the rationale for uh, talking about this, is the fact that wind turbines, because they're unsightly, we try not to like look at them. And in fact, threats may be lurking where uh, our, 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 our uh, prevention is, uh, uh, is, is, is failing. So out of, I guess it's uh, out of sight and out of mind. So, uh, and, and again, these pictures show how close uh, these structures are to uh, uh, cities and towns. Uh, where I find that uh, in the literature, perhaps the security uh, this, uh, uh, the, this, the security discussion is perhaps lacking is in in terms of uh, prevention and response. Uh, that's an area where uh, I, I, I would foresee developments. So we're I think at a very uh, early stage of the uh, discussions about you know how we're going to approach the security challenges of these structures. Uh, which uh, uh, 
Right. Uh, requires, as, as you've heard, uh, an understanding of what we have on the table in terms of maritime instruments, maritime legislation. Um, and uh, I turned, uh, obviously, like several of my colleagues, to the SUA uh, Convention and its protocol. They've been uh, adequately introduced already. Just to give you some figures, I think we, you can see that uh, uh, in terms of the uh, protocol on fixed offshore platforms, which is a very long title, uh, uh, and I don't memorize usually titles. I, I tell my students I don't uh, require you to memorize anything. Uh, so uh, you can see, however, that there are th these European countries are uh, parties now to the uh, 2005 protocol. Uh, Germany, as we've heard, may be added soon to this list. Uh, I've, I think, excluded uh, Liechtenstein from there, uh, but uh, it, it, Austria, I, I, on second thought, I included it because, uh, in fact, there is an issue about uh, extradition and prosecution. So even though uh, Austria does not actually have a continental shelf. Uh, it, the issue of the uh, whether it's a party to that uh, instrument may may arise if if a uh, an Austrian citizen is involved or if an Aust whether as a victim or as an offender. So uh, even landlocked states have a, have a say on uh, as you know on 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 this topic. Uh, the definition you've seen it already. Um, that's, that's basically the core definition of a fixed uh, platform, okay, under the SUA uh, protocol. Uh, and uh, uh, you can, I think we can conclude that uh, it, does, it would cover uh, fixed wind farm uh, structures. It would not cover floating or mobile structures, and I concur on, in that respect with uh, my colleague uh, uh, Rias very much, I think. Uh, the question then arises how, uh, whether those floating structures uh, would be covered by uh, maybe the SUA Convention proper. And I'll go back to that when we look at the definition of ship under the SUA Convention. There is another cons consideration, I think, which is uh, those um, uh, structures that are in transit uh, to be uh, placed permanently on the seabed. Well, uh, can we consider them as um, falling under the purview of this definition? The, question, the answer would probably be no, uh, unless we use some imagination in terms of the, uh, the ultimate uh, destination of those structures. Um, we, we have things like that in the law. Uh, in, in French, we have uh, 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 the, the association of, of a movable property with, uh, by, for, for, uh, based on their destination somehow. But I haven't seen discussions of that my, myself in the literature on this. Uh, so I opened, the, I, I raised the question. I don't necessarily provide an answer, but the answer I think will be easier to find in in terms of the application of the SUA Convention proper. So this is sounding a bit too now uh, technical, uh, but uh, I think you may find some uh, logic. I hope, at some point. The offenses, uh, my colleague has already gone through the, major, the main offenses of the SUA um, instruments. Um, this is an instrument that deals again with uh, the consequences of crimes committed against the safety of navigation or the safety of these structures. So you have these uh, basic um, uh, offenses listed on, on the slide. Uh, seizing or exercising control, acts of violence against a person on board. This is all in relation to fixed platforms. So wind farms would be covered. In, 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 that's, that's what I'm trying to say. We have, let, we have this IMO instrument that covers these already. Uh, whether it was foreseen by the drafters of, the, of SUA that they would be actually uh, covering uh, wind farms uh, in the offshore, that's another question. Um, and Augustine obviously are very ably told us about the, uh, the, the motives behind these, uh, these instruments. 
but the analysis points to, to the conclusion to me uh, as far as I'm concerned that uh, it would cover these uh, offshore installations. Uh, so some further offenses, destroying or damaging the platform, uh, placing of devices, etc. Then we also have the uh, enlarged list of offenses uh, uh, adopted following 9-11 with the uh, 2005 amendment, which are terrorism-related offenses. Okay, so this is part of the new uh, protocol of uh, 2005. Uh, other than that, the jurisdiction, uh, I'll just uh, briefly say that um, uh, uh, states are required to, uh, to uh, uh, legislate for jurisdiction uh, on offenses affecting these fixed platforms. In those cases, it's uh, uh, when the uh, platform is located on their continental shelf, when the offender is a national of that state, or is a victim, uh, or, 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 or a national is a victim of, of the offense. And uh, they, they have an obligation to extradite or prosecute. We've heard that. So that's the regime, the basic regime. And there's a, also a very important obligation to report by contracting states or by state parties to the IMO on the circumstances of the offenses and the result of any prosecution or extrad extradition measures. So that was my uh, uh, bit on the protocol regarding um, uh, platforms. What about the Sue Convention proper? Uh, we've heard also that this is uh, already in force both in terms of its original version and the 2005 uh, amended version. And again, you see the list of uh, European countries that are uh, party to the uh, new 2005 version of the SUA Convention, which um, deals with uh, uh, unlawful acts against the safety of maritime navigation. So the question there is, uh, would, would it deal with those uh, floating or mobile um, uh, wind farms, which exist already perhaps as technology, um, um, I'm not an expert though on that, uh, but I've, I've read that they do exist and uh, that some countries are planning to have them. So the question is, uh, seems to be, uh, uh, possibly there's an answer to that in the sense that the definition of ship under the SUA convention proper may cover, may already encapsulate those uh, structures because it's a ship means a vessel of any type whatsoever not permanently attached to the seabed, including dynamically supported craft, submersibles, or any other floating craft. And there could be an argument that uh, 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 platforms uh, that are in transit to be uh, placed permanently on the seabed could also be covered by this. But that's, uh, that, that's just a, um, a, a, a thin argument uh, uh, at this stage because I don't really have support for that. Um, now, uh, I, uh, moving out of the scope of SUA, which, uh, which you've heard is, is about crimes and, and how to deal with the crimes, the real, the, the, the real uh, core preventive side of IMO instruments is, as you've heard, the ISPS code. And we, you've heard that it doesn't really uh, seem to apply to um, the offshore uh, platforms, except in terms of these mobile offshore drilling units. And uh, Rias showed you the uh, elaborate definitions on that. So the answer seems to, or the, the conclusion seems to be that uh, this is not applicable, that this would not be applicable to uh, uh, wind turbines or their, their grids. Um, so what do we do with that? We have basically a gap, it seems, in international maritime legislation. Now, uh, I've just completed this uh, overview of uh, IMO instruments. Let me just uh, say a bit uh, uh, more about the topic in terms of national perspective, national law perspectives. 
I have here the, uh, a very uh, old uh, U.S. statute, which is the uh, Outer Continental Shelf Lands Act, uh, 1953. Um, this is part of the, uh, uh, you, you, still the U.S. Code uh, um, uh, today. And it's interesting there to, to see how the, um, the uh, um, uh, drafters of this historic piece of legislation uh, tried to cover uh, the offshore structure. This was be before any IMO convention. This was 1953. How their, their approach to that, how, it, how they actually approached the idea of uh, jurisdiction and the laws that should be applied to these structures. And this, obviously this does not deal with the wind farms because it, it's really restricted in a way to, um, to um, I've, I've, I've underlined it I think, it talks about uh, 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 structures that uh, derive resources from the seabed. So there's no applicability to wind farms, but it's very interesting to, to, to note that the provision says the Constitution and laws and civil and political jurisdiction of the United States are extended to the subsoil and seabed of the outer continental shelf and to all artificial islands and all installations and other devices permanently or temporarily attached to the seabed, which may be erected thereon for the purpose of exploring, for developing or producing resources therefrom, or any such installation or other device for the purpose of transporting such resources. So the idea here is that the US legislator back then really uh, wished that these structures be encapsulated under full US law and jurisdiction. Um, this, as I said, is still uh, um, a current law in the U.S. Um, we uh, can uh, stretch a bit our horizon to U.K. legislation, which is a bit more... I, I have some um, uh, bits of maritime legislation from the U.K., which is more uh, contemporary. Uh, the Aviation and Maritime Security Act, 1990 is the uh, uh, UK implementation instrument for SUA. Uh, this act has not been uh, updated since the uh, amendment of those treaties. Uh, the UK is still not a party to uh, the SUA 2005 instruments. However, uh, we have a provision there that already tried to, uh, you see, implement the SUA protocol on uh, fixed offshore platforms back, back in 1990. And we will discover through this uh, analysis of the legislation of the UK that uh, they seem to have uh, legislated in a manner that would exclude um, wind farms today. I, I've shown you that wind farms could be covered under the uh, pr protocol to SUA, but the way that the UK legislation is drafted actu actually excludes that. So they would have a gap today in their legislation with, with respect to the application of, these, of, 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 of the provisions of, of uh, this act. Because uh, when we look at the uh, basic provision, uh, fixed platform uh, means any offshore installation within the meaning of this statute. But then we have to, uh, uh, which is not a ship, uh, okay. Um, any offshore installation within the meaning, right, uh, and all of this, okay. Um, so we really need to look at the definition provided by the statute. And when we do that, we find that it's restricted to uh, extraction of resources from the seabed. I'll show you that. So just moving on, uh, the statute that uh, uh, is referred to, in fact, refers in itself to another instrument. So the, 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 the uh, ultimate uh, provision that uh, governs us is this one, the one you have here, which defines um, the expression offshore installation, means a structure which is or is to be or has been used um, okay, for the expo exploitation or exploration with a view to exploitation of mineral resources by means of a well 
or for the storage of gas. This is clearly not applicable to wind. And if we look at D, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, letter C, that is. D, I, I've omitted uh, letter D because it's uh, clearly not applicable. The only uh, per, uh, paragraph that may be applicable to our wind farms uh, in the offshore uh, seems to be uh, C, which is um, the, is, uh, the structure uh, is defined as uh, uh, being uh, uh, employed for the conveyance of things by means of a pipe. And I'm not sure whether wind farms, uh, through their connection to the uh, power grids, use actually pipes. So it's a question mark whether um, that, that bit of the legislation, in fact, could bring the uh, wind farms into the scope of, uh, of, of our discussion here. The, the conclusion to me seems to be that um, the UK legislator did not foresee that uh, th th these, this type of structures to be covered as part of their approach to the implementation of the SUA protocol. Um, all right, and uh, if we look at uh, some uh, even uh, more recent legislation from the UK, this is um, uh, an order, basically it's a, it's a subsidiary legislation regarding Rampion offshore wind farm. Uh, now that's, uh, that I think is a, is a, is a wind farm uh, being planned for the next few years. Um, uh, I'm not sure whether it's to the east or to the south of the UK. Uh, but uh, anyway, in, in, with respect to uh, the security, there's only one reference to security in this uh, order, Th and this is an interesting uh, uh, model of legislation that is uh, based, basically uh, very much based on the plans that are submitted by the developer uh, to the government, and uh, the uh, an order is 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 then um, uh, taken by by the government on the basis of the submitted plans. And then there are some provisions, obviously, added in into the. Uh, in, uh, into the legislation, and the, there is basically uh, no st uh, this paragraph three, which says that no stage of the connection works shall commence until a construction health, safety, and environmental plan has been uh, submitted and approved. And one of the items in the plan that has to be submitted by the developer is details of the site security. This at, le at least seems to be um, uh, in harmony with the approach of the UK that uh, the uh, Maritime and Aviation Security Act 1990 would not apply to these wind farms because otherwise we wouldn't need to find something like uh, that. So that's very much uh, left open to uh, developers to uh, elaborate upon. Um, another uh, recent instrument also in the same vein, uh, 2015, uh, another uh, projected uh, offshore wind farm in the UK. There is no mention of security whatsoever in that instrument. So to conclude my presentation, uh, just a few points. I'm not sure whether uh, IMO um, uh, consciously uh, was uh, legislating for wind farms. We've the, dissected these instruments in relation to that topic today. Um, is it really a, a, a matter for IMO to deal with? I'm not sure because ultimately IMO is about uh, shipping per se. Of course we've heard about the interconnections between safety and security. So in fact, uh, wind farms may now become an, a, a serious obstacle to navigation. So in that respect, uh, there may be a role for IMO. But uh, um, of course, the wider field now that is being opened up about maritime spatial planet, planning, uh, as they call it in this uh, this side of the Atlantic and um, marine, marine spatial planning, planning uh, in North America definitely would cover um, issues such as security of wind farms. So I'm, I'm just here uh, uh, raising the discussion to the level of who's supposed to actually be 
uh, uh, legislating about this at the international level? Is it the IMO proper in its uh, restricted mandate on shipping or should it be the wider UN governance uh, frameworks? Uh, be that as it may, I, I, I've shown you my analysis and my preliminary conclusions that the, there is coverage of, SUA, of, of wind farms in SUA. And it was interesting to see that the UK implementation of SUA seems to have left them out. So we have that, in a way, discrepancy between the international instruments and uh, the UK legislation. Uh, this could be uh, obviously uh, looked uh, at by um, nations that are now uh, uh, going to sign up to the treaties and, and, and uh, perhaps to learn from uh, those, uh, those precedents. And that, I think, includes my, my, my talk uh, for, this, uh, for this bit. Thank you very much.